Let us pray. O oh God, we thank you for the invitation to come into your house of worship and praise today. We now invoke your presence and your power. Tabernacle with us in a mighty way. Commission those same angels who hung around the cross to be in this place today. And may we declare as we leave here, surely we have been with Jesus and it has been good to have been here. In the name of Jesus, I pray, amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing our opening hymn, All Creatures of Our God and King, hymn number two.
Amen. Thank you for that. And good morning and happy Sabbath. Uh, thank you all uh, for joining us and worshiping with us this morning. You know, this church has been through a lot in the past year, uh, not least of which was you know, the departure of our senior pastor, uh, Pastor Mike. And as I think back, even in the short time that I've been here, you know, the past year, the past five years, and I know many of you have been here much longer than that, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years. In that time, a lot has happened. Uh, a lot of wounded relationships, um, a lot of pain. And as we look forward uh, to the next year, the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, 40 years, uh, we want those wounds to be healed. We want those relationships to be reconciled. And especially now, as we're in a process of looking for a new senior pastor, we want uh, to seek God's face in a more earnest way way and to seek his will uh, for this congregation. So for healing from the past and hope for the future, the pastors are dedicating the next seven weeks as a special time of prayer and fasting and spiritual renewal here at Vallejo Drive. So briefly, I want to run through you, uh, run through with you a little bit of what that's going to look like. It begins uh, this Wednesday night and every Wednesday night for the next seven weeks. Uh, the Koinonia program has been revamped with a little bit more of a practical emphasis. Uh, because we want to make it easier for you to come early and participate, uh, we will, uh, starting this week at 6 p.m., be offering a dinner for anyone who wants to come beginning at 6 o'clock. Then our program, our discussion, will begin around 6.30, around 6.45. So if you can't be there right at 6, that's okay. But dinner is at 6, and discussion following. We're going to be looking at seven spiritual practices uh, that will help bring transformation to your life and to this church. And if you're worried about what to do with kids, as always, we have the Koinonia Kids Program that runs alongside of it. On Friday nights, uh, for our worship service in the chapel, uh, we're going to be going through a series on the seven deadly sins for the next seven weeks. And I'm looking forward to that as a time of introspection uh, and learning ways of finding peace and reconciliation and victory in our lives. And finally, on Sabbath mornings, we're going to be going through each week uh, what I'm calling uh, Journey to the Cross. So the pastor's have put together this sermon series. And one of the exciting things as we walk step by step through uh, the ministry of Jesus on his way to crucifixion, uh, we already have lined up uh, a couple of guest speakers that are gonna make that an exciting uh, opportunity. So the next seven weeks are gonna be an important time for us. And as I always tell people, this is the kind of thing that the more you put into it, the more you will get out of it, okay? So I really, really urge you uh, to participate in these programs, and I promise you that as you do, we as a church uh, will find healing, we will find reconciliation, and find strength in God's will. So if you would like a recap of that, I'll be in the back afterwards with these handouts matching our slide, and on the back it will have a schedule of all of the upcoming events in the next seven weeks. So if you can participate in any of that, uh, I, I promise you God's blessing as you do that. Now, uh, we have a special guest who is going to uh, come up and share with us a little bit about heart health. Uh, today is uh, a heart health emphasis Sabbath. So please, thank you. Thank you and good morning. When uh, Pastor Papendick asked me to talk about uh, heart health, it came to my mind the text from Proverbs 4, 23, that it says, above all else, guard your heart. If we take a text from the New Testament, they say that our body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So we have very clear indications from God that we have to guard our heart and that we have to be stewards of the gift of life that God has given us. 
Uh, probably you have heard this, and in this nation, heart disease has been the number one uh, disease for many years. But unfortunately, it has happened at a world level. For many years, and mostly because infectious diseases were happening so often in Africa and in uh, many other uh, parts of the world that they didn't have the advances that we have in, in the, what we call the developed world, uh, infectious diseases were the number one. Unfortunately, now, heart disease is the number one killer at the world level. Now, as members of this church, we have been blessed by knowing that a plant-based diet is healthier than otherwise. It, that has led to the knowledge that as an average Seventh-day Adventist, we are living about eight years longer than the general population. That has uh, given us the information that we do have a little less cancer than people that do not follow what the, if we know that is uh, the best for our health. If we list the th benefits that we have from what our church has been preaching for the last 120 years plus, we have less hypertension. Unfortunately, it's not zero. And, uh, uh, but there is very interesting information. Vegans don't get so much hypertension. Hypertension is very common on people 60 years and older. The estimation that uh, the statisticians give us is that around the general population, anybody that's 60 or older has a 50% chance that will have hypertension. Um, so uh, the knowledge of the uh, healthy plant-based diet has helped us to reduce hypertension. We do have less cancer. There are less diabetics in our population. So we have been blessed in multiple ways, and we don't have the time to go in detail, but uh, I think the challenge for all of us uh, is to share this knowledge that we have had for many years ahead of science. I'm very impressed. Last week, I received every month a CDs of education on cardiac care. And on one of those CDs, they were talking about how do we change the eating habits of the American population. And they talk about the Seventh-day Adventist Church of what the benefits have been. But the challenge is that the science has found that it is difficult to change eating habits unless you start very early in life. And I think that that's something that we, we are doing it in our church, but we should try to do it at national level. And start teaching kids to eat properly when they are three, four, five years old. And when they have looked at populations where that was done, what is found is not only that those kids are healthier, they are not so heavy, they have lower cholesterol, they have lower pressures, but their parents have the same benefits. So um, the challenge for us as church is to share this light with the, with the world. A couple of issues, we are in the middle of the a flu epidemic, and some people have questions about the flu vaccine. On the same CDs that I received last week, they show a study that they look into heart attacks and the flu. During the week that a person has the flu, the risk of having a heart attack is six-fold higher that a year later. So some people eh, tell me when I offer the vaccine, I don't need it, I never get sick. The issue is that eh, in the past, 
that has happened. But in the future, we can be preventing the major complications that the flu can produce. So I encourage all of you to take the flu vaccine that can reduce mortality. We have a wonderful a truth on the a beliefs of a, what Sister White said, that we should develop our body, our mind, and our soul. And if we follow what the God asks us to consider life a gift of God, we will follow what has been told to us. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Purdue, for that uh, short uh, presentation. And now's the time for our children's story. Audrey's going to be telling a story for us. Uh, and for those of us who aren't children, feel free to stand up anyway, stretch your legs, and greet the neighbor next to you. Children, come on down. I have a story to tell you. Now it's your time. Boy, oh boy, don't I love to see you guys here every time I come to tell the story. And it's so wonderful to see you. Good morning. Who can tell me how do you know if someone loves you? Yes. Their face turns red. Ooh, that's a good one. All right, I saw another hand. Yes. How can you tell if someone loves you? Um, your mom and dad can hug you, and they can kiss you, and they can say, I love you. They can hug you, they can kiss you, they can say, I love you. Anybody else knows? How can you tell if someone loves you? Yes. One last one. If they watch over you and just take care of you. Very good. Do you have a comment? If they look at you from a distance. If they look at, but how is that look from a distance? Give me that look. Okay, okay, that's a frightening love right there. Okay, I'm going to tell you a story of three best friends. There were three girls. They used to do everything together. There was Abby, Beatrice, and Carla. They went to the park together to play. They went to the same school. They, they played match clothes day. They had the same shoes. They liked the same toys. They went to birthday parties together. They did everything together. Who has a best friend? Yes? What do you call them? BFFs, right? Yes, best friends forever. Yes, so they were BFFs. They did everything. All right, let's... Let's, let's go to, let's go to the park. Sure, let's go to the park. And then the other kid, the other, the, uh, Beatrice would say, Oh, uh, tomorrow I'm going shopping with mom. All right, I want to go shopping with, say, Carla and, and, and Abby. So they went everywhere together. They were inseparable. You know what that is? Inseparable? That's a big word, right? Yeah, when you do everything together, you don't separate for anything. That's how they were. One day they went shopping with mom. And mom went to one place and they were looking at a store from a toy store. They went to a clothing store. They went to a shoe store. And all of a sudden, Abby said, oh, 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 I, my mom said I'm going to get a fish. And I, I want to choose a, a, an aquarium for my fish. So they saw this pet shop and they all walked in the pet shop looking for fish things to put inside the fish tank. All of a sudden, Abby said, oh, that 
fish tank is the most beautiful fish tank I've ever seen. And, and Beatrice and Carla went to see the fish tank and all of a sudden Abby grabbed that fish tank. It was heavy. It was made of glass. And all of a sudden, boom, the fish tank fell on her foot and it broke. Oh no, there were glasses all over the store. The owner of the store heard a big crashing noise and he came rushing to see what was going on and Abby was on the floor. Oh, my foot, my foot. And the, the owner was looking at all that glass on the floor and saying, what happened? And she said, I dropped the fish tank by accident. And the owner of the store saw her foot that was bleeding and the glass all over the place. And he said, you know what? Here in this store, we have a policy. You break it, you pay for it. And she's like, but it was an accident. It doesn't matter. When you break something in the store, you have to pay for it. And she said, but wait, wait, I, I, can't, I can't pay for it because I don't have any money. And he said, well, there's one option. You can work for it and pay for that fish tank. He said, but I can't work because I'm, my foot is hurt. And he said, I don't care. You break it, you pay it. That's the rule. I'm not going to pay for the fish tank. You broke it, you have to pay for it. And then she goes like, but I, I can't. And he said, okay, there's an option. Since your foot is broken, if you can't do it, someone has to do it for you. And she said, she looked at her two friends, at Beatrice and Carla, and she's like, guys, what do I do now? And Beatrice turned to her and said, I'm sorry, I can't, I can't, I can't work. I can't do it. I'm, I'm busy. I can't do it. And Carla looked at her and she went like, you know what, Abby? I will work for you. You're hurt. I'm your friend. And I'm going to work all those hours that you need to work to pay for that fish tank. So they arranged the hours that she had to go and work. And Carla worked for all those hours that Abby had to work until the fish tank was paid off. Now, let me ask you something. Weren't they best friends? Yes. Weren't they BFFs? Didn't they do everything together? Okay. Did Beatrice liked Abby? The one that said, no, I'm not going to do it. Did she like her? Did she love her? Did Carla love her? Why did Carla love her? Yes. She said she would work, um, we, she'd work for the fish tank. She would do the punishment for the fish tank, right? Until the fish tank was paid off. Is that correct? Well, let me tell you something. Long ago, someone said there's a punishment for the people that are doing wrong things. But that punishment was paid by Jesus. Jesus loved us so much that not only he worked for it, but he gave his life. He, he died for our sins, so we don't have to die because of our sins. And we have salvation based on that love, the real love. Now I have to tell you one more thing. Who knows what we celebrate this week? Anybody? Yes? Let me give a hint to those who don't know what we celebrate this week. What is this? Yes. Yes. And we show, we show people that we love them when we give them a box of chocolate. We give them flowers. We do something nice to them. But you know what the most important love is? The love that Jesus have for you. That he died for us long ago. But until this day, we remember that Jesus died for us. And that love speaks to us until these days. Don't ever forget that. Now all children can quietly go to children's worship. And thank you so much for listening quietly.
Will the deacons please come forward to collect the offering? While the deacons are coming forward, many years ago when I was growing up, I knew about Los Angeles and I knew about Glendale. And you know why? I knew that the Voice of Prophecy was located here in Glendale and the box number was 5555 Los Angeles. The ability for the Adventist radio ministry and now the TV ministry to go around the world is clear. There are many people in the Caribbean, many people in Asia, many people in Africa that listens to these ministries. If we support it, it will continue. Today our offering is for Adventist TV ministry. If you're so inclined to support it, please list it on your tight offering, tight envelope offering. Please collect the offering. <laughs> that you bless it and multiply it in Jesus name we pray amen please be seated
At this time, I invite anyone who has a special burden on their heart, uh, a prayer request for themselves or uh, for someone else, and just for anyone, especially as we enter uh, a season of more earnest prayer, anyone who uh, wants to just dedicate or rededicate their lives to God this morning, I invite you to come forward uh, and pray with us here in the front as we sing our prayer song number 671. Please kneel with us as we pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you to give you honor and to give you praise. We surrender ourselves to you. May you be the Lord of our lives. All the things in our life that have worried us or stressed us, health concerns, financial concerns, troubled relationships with family and with friends, all our worries about the future, we lay them at your feet. We surrender them to your will, trusting that when we face adversity, we will grow stronger. And when we experience your healing, your name will be glorified. So Lord, we lift ourselves up to you, entrusting you with our daily needs. Bring guidance where there is confusion. Bring faith where there is doubt. Bring healing where there is brokenness. But Lord, we ask not only for ourselves, but for those around us in need. May we not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood, but to understand, not to be loved, but to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. And above all else, send us your Holy Spirit to conform us to the image of your Son, Jesus Christ. Give us the wisdom, the courage, and the self-control to do what is right, so that in all things we may bring praise and honor and glory to your name. And this we ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the Gospel of Mark. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here, which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter, and James, and John, and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, 
And they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, and they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And suddenly, when they looked round about, they saw no man any more, save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen, till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. Amen. On this Sabbath, which is the first Sabbath of this Black History Month, I want to just talk to you from this passage on the subject I've entitled, The Blood Speaks. The Blood Speaks. Pray with me, gracious God. Make me just a nail upon the wall, securely fastened in its place. And there, upon that nail so small, hang a picture of your lovely face. So all in this place may truly know that it is you here by your grace. Amen. Anything or anybody that rises and exalts itself above Christ is sin. And all sin requires a blood sacrifice of death. Mark sandwiches this story of Christ's transfiguration between two conversations about his death and his resurrection. Mark writes to a Gentile audience to portray Jesus as heaven's eternal Valentine's gift of love and grace for all people. In Mark chapter 8, verse 31, Jesus predicts his death as that sacrifice. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and of the chief priest and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And then in Mark chapter 9, verse 9, Jesus says to Peter, James and John, don't tell anybody what you have seen till the Son of Man were to rise from the dead. Mark structures this story to show the glory of the transfiguration eclipsing the shame of Christ's death and the victorious resurrection, for he is the sacrificial Lamb of God. And so the Mount of Transfiguration, on that Mount Jesus appears glorified. His divinity flashes through his humanity for he alone with his precious shed blood can satisfy both God and fallen humanity. In Mark chapter 9 verses 2 to 9, his transfiguration story shines with luminous glory. Here Jesus takes his closest disciples, Peter, James, and and John and leads them up into a high unnamed mountain by themselves. Let me just pause here parenthetically to say being close to Jesus may require you to climb some mountains. Sometimes we love our time with Jesus while in the plains and valleys for there we find in him a comforting presence. But following Jesus may require us to climb the mountainside and there we may face temptations, tests, and trials, yet Jesus may lead us way up on high just to behold his glory. If you feel very close to God this morning, yet you struggle to make progress in life, just know Jesus might be 
leading you upward. If you find yourself exhausted yet still faithful and trusting, he might be leading you up some great pinnacled peak where you might catch a brand new glimpse of his glory. If your body aches and you feel winded in your Christian walk, he has promised never to leave you, never to leave you alone. Sometimes when I find my road rough and rocky, I just got to bow my head and sing that African-American spiritual. I'm climbing up on the rough side of the mountain. I must hold to God's his powerful hand. I'm coming up on the rough side of the mountain. I'm doing my best to make it in. Just, just look at the text. Look at the text. He leads them up to a high mountain. And he was transfigured there before them. That means changed and transformed. His clothing shined with a luminescent glory, white as snow. His face glowed radiantly. Then Mark records these disciples saw Elijah and Moses appear. Moses who climbed Mount Sinai to receive the law. And Elijah who climbed Mount Carmel and called down fire from heaven. Both now appeared talking with Jesus in all of his glory. Oh, what a beautiful picture. Our Lord appears talking to Moses who gave the law to inform every legalistic uh, law person that they too must talk to Jesus for he alone fulfills the whole law. And our Lord appears talking to Elijah to let every end time Bible thumping prophetic timeline calculating present truth preaching three angels message teaching vegetarian veggie link eating Sabbath keeping preacher and member know that every Bible prophecy past, present, and future finds fulfillment and completion and realization in Jesus Christ our Lord. Ah, oh, but some trouble hides in this Bible story. Look at verse 5. Look at verse 5. Then Peter said, let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. You see, Peter didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. What do you do when three powerful spiritual leaders show up? You've got Moses on the one side and Elijah on the other side and the Lord Jesus right in the middle. Peter says, let's just build a church house for all three of them. And folks, therein lies the trouble in the Bible. The fallen nature of our humanist drives us to enshrine earthly leaders in churches and temples and tabernacles. Mm -hmm. We seek to follow everyone and everything but Jesus. God gave both Moses and Elijah as divinely appointed leaders, but all human beings possess a drive that compels us to use God's gifts as a source of division, separation, and pride. Peter missed this, the picture that Christ must be glorified and exalted. Peter missed the truth that the Mosaic law and Elijah's prophetic message culminate and resonate in the person of Christ Jesus. Peter lost sight of the glorified Christ who alone makes us brand new. He focused himself on what he can make with God's leaders. It is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter now stands poised to start some trouble in the Bible. I can hear them now. What, 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 what temple are you worshiping at? Hmm? Oh, I go to Moses' tabernacle, and oh, I go to uh, Elijah's tabernacle. I think it's better. Oh, no, you must know that Jesus' tabernacle is best. The sin of exalting anything or anybody to compete with Christ Jesus lurks and lingers in this passage but it always leads to a polarization of our humanity it establishes an us versus them group dynamic human nature wants to establish Moses followers over here and Elijah's followers over there though Christ Jesus bids us all to follow him and the moment you separate and divide human beings you set up future generations for racism prejudice ethnic pride religious superiority 
bigotry, and ethnocentricity. Oh, but thanks be to God for his unspeakable gift in Christ Jesus. He bridges the divide between Moses and Elijah. He unifies all who follow Moses and all who follows Elijah. If Moses lived and led and pointed to Jesus. Elijah lived and led and pointed to Jesus. And now Jesus came. God glorified him and all must follow him as he leads us every step of the way. But Peter missed all this because he didn't know what to say and he just felt too scared in the present moment. He says, let's take these prominent leaders, historical church folk leaders God has given us, exalt them alongside the glorified Christ and build temples. Oh, I'm so glad my own mother taught me, son, when you feel scared and don't know what to say, just shut up and say nothing. Because it's far better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. And that's what's going on in our world today. We don't just have trouble in the Bible, but we got some trouble in the world. Trouble in the world caused by fearful folks who should be silent. God made of one blood all nations. And Jesus calls all of us on our spiritual climb upward and higher to God's throne. Oh, but while beholding the glorious beauty of Jesus. Uh, years ago, somebody said, let's call division and separation amongst God's family. Let's create different races and ideologies and philosophies and religions and churches so that people can focus on themselves instead of the luminescent glory and beauty and majesty of Jesus. Ah, don't you get it twisted now. I'm not saying differences cause trouble. Our God loves diversity and calls us to work together and celebrate our differences so differences don't cause trouble. Taking our eyes off Jesus does. Fixating on self and glorifying our flesh does. Building temples that enshrine our cherished leaders does. Because the moment we build up earthly temples and religions and races, we fixate on our differences. And when we focus on our differences, we naturally seek to evaluate and the quality and the viability and the superiority of the person based on their traits and characteristics. And that kind of thinking spells all the trouble in the world because there is no characteristic, no one characteristic, no one phenotype, and no one kind of complexion that can accurately measure race nor nationality. And nobody chooses their culture, their language, their race, or their heritage. God and God alone chooses all of that for you as God's gift to you. But somebody somewhere came along and used the blessed gifts God gave to create a division that turns our focus off of Christ and now the whole world fixates inwardly on self and on the flesh of our, their cultural heritage, the flesh of their racial background, their skin color, their ethnic heritage, their religious traditions, and their sexual orientation. We identify ourselves by where we came from, what language we speak, and what color we are. We fixate on our legacy, our pedagogy, and our ethnic heritage. All of these are mere blessings from God. He gave that to us, but just like Peter took the gift of Moses and Elijah's temporary presence and wanted to build temples for them, every cultural group seeks to worship at the temple shrine of their own race and skin color and nationalistic heritage and language. We all possess the same drive to enshrine our uniqueness and worship our differences and establish a touted superiority as a false sense of security rooted in pride and self. This kind of identification with self fuels our fears because any look away from Christ alienates us from God. It generates our guilt because any brokenness in our relationship with God represents our own rejection of God's will and God's way and it generates our shame because the enemy uses the platform of our guilt to stand upon and accuse us in the present moment. Instantly we feel a deep-seated sense of inadequacy and shame like there's something wrong with me and I'm not enough. This trilogy of fear, guilt, and shame 
dominates and rules us. Fear dominates our future. Guilt dominates our past. While shame consumes our present moment. So we cannot be free. We cannot help but hide from a searching God and run in fear from a cruel, insensitive world with this mindset. This results in a humanity relating like strangers instead of a family. A nation of immigrants that now fears immigrants. A broken people looking down their noses at other broken people and in the final analysis we have endless restlessness strife and war oh but thanks be to God for even though we find this trouble in the Bible and this same trouble in the world I've also found God's grace in the Bible and God's grace in the world for these circumstances first see the grace in the Bible verse 7 says a cloud came over them and a voice came out of that cloud saying, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no man, any old woman, no man, nobody there anymore except Jesus, the Christ. And therein lies the beginning of grace in the Bible for Peter, James, and John, that God would remove the very objects of their fixation and refocus their attention on Jesus the Christ. The voice from the cloud simply says, this is my beloved son, listen to him. You've heard Moses in the law and you've heard prophet Elijah, now just listen to Jesus the Christ. And so I sat back in my chair, ready to hear what Jesus would say. Hmm? But Jesus didn't say very much in the next verses of this passage. He simply said, don't mention this until after my death and resurrection. It seems like something about the death and resurrection of Jesus speaks volumes more than any words from the lips of Jesus. And I wanted to know why Jesus didn't have more to say. And I sat up late last night wrestling with the text to understand how God's voice from the cloud could say, this is my son, listen to him. Yet he didn't have very much to say in the passage. And finally, early this morning, as I prayed over this message, I heard the Spirit say, Peter, Peter, some things require much more than words. And so just look at Mount Calvary, for there the blood speaks. And then I got it. On this Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus points to his shed blood on Mount Calvary. Mount Calvary fixes the trouble of the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, don't tell this story till you have experienced Calvary. And that's all I came to say to you this day. For therein lies God's grace in the world, the blood of Calvary. 2,000 years ago, Jesus drew every human being with cords of love. He carried the entire fragmented, divided, broken human family with him up on Mount Calvary. All humanity stood doomed and condemned without hope in the world but that all changed when he shed his blood and that shed blood now speaks on our behalf oh the blood still speaks for on that cross with his dying last dying breath he said it is finished oh how the blood speaks what his words could not say you see neither Peter James nor John nor any of us can embrace a glorified Lord until we first talk about a crucified Savior something about his death on Calvary forms the context and transformative power of the transfiguration. You see, in Mark chapter 9, Christ Jesus is glorified because he will be crucified. This glorious transfiguration prefigures his shameful crucifixion and his precious blood shed freely on Mount Calvary speaks for every man, woman, boy, or girl. The blood of Jesus did what we could not do for ourselves. We could not free ourselves from the bondage of sin but by his precious blood we have been set free oh how do you know the blood speaks brother preacher oh I thought you'd never ask historically the blood has always spoken In Genesis chapter 4 verse 10 God says to Cain the blood of thy brother Abel cries out from the ground but then in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 24 the Amplified Bible reads it this way and to Jesus the mediator the go-between agent of a new covenant and to the sprinkled blood which speaks 
of mercy, a better and nobler, more gracious message than the blood of Abel, which cried out for vengeance. The blood of Abel cried out to God for vengeance and punishment, but Christ's blood speaks and cries out for mercy and pardon. The blood speaks of far better things like eternal life and freedom and victory and power and love and grace. Oh, the blood speaks of all us as part of God's great family. I'm not knocking multiculturalism or individuality or internationalism. I'm just saying we all belong to God's great familyism. I'm just saying that's the way it is in God's world. I'm a Canadian. My mother birthed me in Trinidad. My wife, Melissa, was born in Guyana. My son, Jesse, was born in Barbados. My daughter, Jasmine, was born right here in these United States. But all of us form one family. Hmm? Your birthplace makes no difference. Your cultural heritage doesn't matter. Your language doesn't matter. Your racial identification doesn't matter. And sexual orientation doesn't matter. All of us together make up God's family because the blood that binds us is greater than the water that divides us. All from different lands and cultures and places, but all from one family. Acts chapter 17 verse 26 says, God made of one blood, one red blood, all nations. Satan ruined all humanity in one man, Adam, but God redeemed all humanity in one man, Christ Jesus, our Lord. Uh, Romans 8, 17 says, what, when we accepted Jesus as our Savior and the blood was applied to our hearts, we became children of God and joined heirs to, uh, with Jesus Christ in God's family. And we all collectively share a new life, the life of God. Oh, the blood speaks of who we are and who we are and what we have it speaks to us of righteousness we cannot stand before God in self-righteousness but we can stand before him in the righteousness of Jesus because of his shed blood they wounded him in his head for our evil thoughts they wounded him in his hands for our evil deeds they wounded him in his feet for our evil walk they wounded him in his side for that inordinate affection called lust and from these wounds the blood flows and the blood speaks speaks to cancel all sins that haunt us in our past, distract us in our present, and tempt us in our future. The blood speaks to break the shackles that bind us and shatter the glass ceilings that limit us and demolish the barriers that bar us and white out the lines that divide us and out the fires of hell that threaten to consume us and dry up the watery seas that separates us and complete the sad stories that entangle us and show the love that saves us and the grace that redeems us and the spirit that fills us and the joy that thrills us. Oh, the blood speaks. I like how Watchman Nee says it in the normal Christian life. The blood is for God and speaks to God. And nobody can place more value in the blood than God can. For God says, when I see the blood, I will pass over. So the blood speaks to quench the wrath of an angry God against sin so that I no longer live fearful of God. God ain't mad at me because the blood of Jesus still speaks. And if God values the blood of Jesus enough to forgive our sins, then every child of God must also value value the blood for the blood of Jesus also speaks to every man, woman, boy and girl uh, to cleanse a guilty conscience and to free us from our past. But then since Satan stands on the platform of our guilt and accuses us of being unworthy in the present moment and causes us to feel a sense of shame, this blood must also speak towards Satan to silence all his accusations. But how does he do that, brother preacher? How does the blood do that? Oh, the blood of Jesus puts God on my side against Satan. Oh, I got to quit now, but I want you to know God may never send me to Mexico to start a new social order. God may never send me to Venezuela to end political unrest. God may never send me to Colombia to eradicate drug cartels. God may never send me, he may never ask me to help Armenia acquire real prosperity and freedom. He may never lead me to Haiti to lift that nation out of dire poverty. I may never feel called to India to end the caste system and bring relief to the millions of untouchables. I may never have a chance to go to North Korea to end the evil dictatorship of King Jong-un's oppressive communist 
regime, I may never have the opportunity to go to the Philippines to end the continued scourge of annual typhoons ravishing some of the 7,100 islands every year. God may never send me to Nigeria to shut down the armed Boko Haram militia that kidnaps young girls seeking an education. I may never have the power to fix the permeating injustices that plague our own country here in the United States. But by God's grace and by God's power, I'll go anywhere to tell everybody and anybody that there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flow lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that makes me white as snow. Ah, oh, no other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. I invite you today to plead the blood of Jesus in every situation, for every circumstance, for every issue, for every problem. Plead the blood of Jesus over your family, over your household, over your workplace, over your education, over your future. Plead the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus has a power and that blood will never lose its power. If you want to accept his blood as payment for your sins today, and you pledge to plead the blood. Won't you just stand with me all over the building? Stand with me and let's worship him with this song, The Blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus shed on me back on the reed oh the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power for it reaches to the highest mountain mountain and it flows through the lowest valley valley the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its power well it's and calms all my fears and it wipes away all my tears oh the blood that gives me strength from day to day it will never lose its time for it Reaches to the highest mountain, mountain, and it flows through the lowest valley, valley. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never. It's power. Gracious God, we thank you. Thank you today for the precious blood of Jesus. And Lord, we thank you that it still has power. It still works today. It brings healing. It brings transformation. It brings change. It brings satisfaction to our hearts. Lord, today for this great community of faith. Lord, we come from different places. We are of different origins. But Lord, I thank you today that we are all one family 
in Christ Jesus because of the blood. Lord, I thank you today that we can claim the blood and plead the blood and apply the blood. And I just pray right now for each one here under the sound of my voice that this blood, the blood of Jesus, would go to work in our lives, bring about transformation, bring about healing, bring about settling of arguments and fixing of fights, bring about all that we need. Oh God, bring about answers to our problems, solutions to our issues, bring about a complete transformation of our humanity. For Lord, we pray and we know and we trust that this blood will never lose its power. And so as we go from this place today, oh God, I just ask that we will continue by your Spirit's presence to claim the blood and plead the blood and apply the blood. Help us never to forget that the blood of Jesus still speaks even today. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless you. Be seated.